Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. If I could get your attention for a few quick moments, I'd like to first thank you all very, very much for joining us here this afternoon in the Alexander Hotel. I'm Mandy Johnston. I'm a business owner. I'm a broadcaster. I'm somebody who's worked in the university uh, space here in Ireland. So I'm very, very interested in today's topic, which should provide a very fruitful discussion. And we're looking forward to some interaction with all of you later on. We're delighted that you could all join us here for this combined in-person and online event. It's great to welcome so many delegates from across the university sector here in Ireland, but also from enterprise, from business and from politics as well. So for those of you who are joining us online, I just want to mention that we have closed captioning today. It's available to alter the size of the text. You can do so by just clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. So to kick us off today, I just want to introduce you to our keynote speaker. First of all, he is Michael Lohan. He's Chief Executive Officer of IDA Ireland. And later on, Michael is going to share his views with us on the central role of universities in attracting international companies here to Ireland. I also want to introduce our panelists briefly. We're going to be joined by Professor David Fitzpatrick, who is President of TU Dublin and also Chair of the IUA Council for 2024. And last but certainly not least, Mike Berry, who is former country manager of Amazon Web Services and now chair of the UCD Governing Authority. So first up today, I would like to welcome Michael Lohan to the stage. Sorry, I've made my first mistake already. Uh, I'd like to welcome Professor David Fitzpatrick, who's going to issue a, wor a word of welcome. Thank you very much. And I thought I'd got off the hook there, but uh, no, no such luck. Um, as chair of the Irish University Association, it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome you here uh, today and also a welcome to those of you online. The IOA Future of Ireland series started five years ago. Uh, surprisingly, maybe we don't realize it's been that long. And essentially, it was developed in order to let the universities highlight the role that we believe we play in our economy and society and also to bring people together to discuss how universities can continue to build and to shape the future of the nation. The theme for today, as you've already heard, is one that maps directly to that ambition to build and shape the future of Ireland, with foreign direct investment being crucially important to us. And what we hope we'll get to is a really important discussion around how universities are a key partner in the development of the FDI sector and all that that brings and entails. As we explore the theme, we really look forward to hearing from Michael as to why the supply of high skills talent is so important to FDI companies and equally how the substantial research and innovation agendas and activities both within universities and within enterprise and business are enablers to that, uh, that FDI activity. All of which, of course, are underpinned by the policy and action on the part of government and their agencies. So thank you once again for joining us and uh, now I'll stand down. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for that. And thank you for jumping up very quickly to, to take your spot. I appreciate it. Now, I would like to introduce you to our guest speaker today. Michael Lowen is a graduate of the University of Galway and also the Berkeley Executive Programme. Michael Lowen took up his role as Chief Executive Officer of the IDA in April of 2023. So I think you're Annual review is on its way up, Michael. Um, he's based here in, in Dublin in the headquarters. The key priority for Michael in his role as CEO is leading on the execution and delivery of the IDA's organizational strategy, delivering recovery and sustainable growth 2021 to 2024. So again, Michael, time is running out. You have only this year to complete it. But Michael, I would like to welcome you to the stage. Thank you, Mandy, and thank you, David, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to, uh, to be part of this afternoon's conversation, and I suppose to have an open and candid conversation on the role of universities in shaping Ireland's future and attracting foreign direct investment, which, of course, is so key to, to uh, as Mandy put it, my annual review, which is coming up in, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but I suppose in seriousness, I suppose what um, has really been embedded to me over the last number of, of months since I've taken on the role 
And then particularly, you know, for the month of January, um, I actually spent a lot of the month traveling um, both within the US and within, within Europe, that the high quality education system and the skilled workforce makes Ireland an attractive destination for investors. But as the world changes rapidly, we need to ensure that our university remains relevant and indeed our workforce remains competitive. Throughout my remarks this afternoon, I will be discussing some practical strategies to strengthen the link between academia and industry, importantly to foster innovation, and critically to equip our workforce with the skills needed to thrive in a rapidly evolving environment. The last few years have certainly been, I suppose, unprecedented in terms of change. So for a few moments, I'm just going to set maybe the international landscape from an FDI perspective, and then I'll speak to Ireland's performance and what that means from, uh, I suppose, a university perspective. We've seen change from Brexit to COVID, geopolitical uncertainties, changes in our corporate tax policy, which of course are critically important. And also what we've seen in the last two years in particular is a renewed focus on industrial policies right across the globe. And this in terms of on top of inflationary pressures and indeed supply chain interruptions and disruption that we've seen during COVID and are now seeing because of the, mo the, the most, I suppose, uh, impacts we're seeing across the globe in terms of, of, of uh, geopolitical continues to cause, I suppose, that uncertainty in global landscapes. But at ID Ireland, we remain vigilant, working closely with our partners to assess the impacts and importantly, to provide support where necessary. Just to put it in context, Ireland ranks seventh in Europe for announced projects in, in, in latest results. And that shows, I suppose, the importance of Ireland's value proposition. And critically, in part of that is embracing transformation would be key to Ireland's sustained success particularly in the context of the government's white paper on enterprise, which outlines that vision to 2030. And as the agency within the government, we are actively collaborating with the Department of, Ed of Enterprise, Trade and Employment to ensure the full implementation of the white paper. At a fundamental level, Ireland's value proposition for FDI continues to focus on the strengths that makes Ireland globally competitive. And maybe I'll just spend a moment in highlighting a few of those key areas. Number one, stability of economic and political environment, critically, critically important, and no more so than we look at the world today. Enhanced focus on sustainability and the green recovery, so the twin transition, critically important. A highly educated young population. Without doubt, these are the three factors that I and my colleagues here on a constant basis and our engagement with, with our enterprise base. And you can add to that consistency of pro-business policies, our unwavering commitment to the EU membership, and indeed leading industries and clusters which have been built in Ireland over many generations and which the university sector has been key to ensure we built those clusters as well. It's important to remember that Ireland's existing base of foreign direct investment is a core national asset and one that we must continuously nurture and develop. If we look at the impact from our multinational sector, we can measure it in many ways. If we look at the performance in terms of economic performance, 315 billion was in terms of national exports in 2022. That's 70% of our total economy's exports come from the sector. But if we look beyond that and we look to the tax receipts, 70% of corporate tax receipts you know, come from the, from the multinational sector. In a world marked by uncertainty, resilience becomes our greatest asset. As Ireland stands at the crossroads of geopolitical shift, technological advancement, and global change, we must not only weather that storm, but we must harness those winds to make sure we sail towards new opportunities. And when I speak of those opportunities, I'm just going to take a moment to reflect on, the, on 2023, the year that was, seeing as my scorecard is coming up in a few weeks. Last year, you know, against the backdrop, and we know what the, what the global backdrop was last year in terms of a technology reset. But in Ireland, we secured 248 investments, an increase on the investment numbers from the previous year. And what drove that increase? What drove that increase was innovation, was the depth of the skills that we have in Ireland and the ability to perform and deliver. And importantly, of those 248 investments, 83 of them were what we would classify as first time greenfield investment in Ireland. So not alone are we winning investment from our existing base, we're also attracting new innovation and new companies that see Ireland as a home in which they can grow and prosper. 
But we also, I suppose, look at the, the, the case of the enduring impact of FDI. Over 300,000 people are directly employed by our, by our FDI client companies. And that showcases the enduring strength of the business environment that we have in Ireland. But important, looking beyond the bustling streets here of Dublin, I am very proud to say that our regional success continues to shine in 2023. Out of those 248 investments, we secured 54% of those outside of Dublin. So that's 132 investments beyond the Dublin region. And this strong regional performance reflects a commitment to foster economic growth and opportunity across the entire Ireland of Ireland. So where does education lie in all of this? Well, the truth is the convergence of education and business is not merely a partnership. It's a catalyst for transformation. It's where ideas are born, knowledge is applied, and breakthroughs are made. In the nexus of education and business lies the key to unlocking the full potential of our society, all of our society. It's where theory meets practice, aspiration meets opportunity, and innovation meets impact. So as I thought about this, to, to, to this afternoon's uh, discussion, it brought me to, to sort of consider two fundamental points of reflection. One is, what is the role of our universities in supporting the efforts to attract FDI? And secondly, how are we doing? How do we rank in positioning Ireland in terms of talent and R&D? And critically, what are we going to do next? So as I share some thoughts in this area, I'm just going to say that our people are the bedrock of the Irish economy's growth on which our competitiveness in global markets is built upon. High quality talent is one of Ireland's key selling points. Our client base consistently talk about the criticality of skills to their business. In fact, in our 2022 client survey, the availability and development of talent was one of the most important factors influencing the performance of our clients' business, along with technological change. And in the areas, these are the areas where our clients required us to put renewed and enhanced focus. In a rapidly evolving global economy, the true measure of competitiveness lies not only in resources we possess today, but more importantly, in the capacity to innovate and adapt for tomorrow. Currently, Ireland is a competitive location when it comes to talent. Third level attainment among our 25 to 30, 34 year olds is at 62% which is significantly higher than the EU average, which is at 42%. Since 2016, there's been a marked increase in terms of higher education enrollment by a factor of almost 14%. We have the highest level of STEM graduates per, per capita in the EU among the 20 to 29 year olds. Over the past decade, there's been steady growth in the number of graduates from IT, science, maths, and engineering disciplines, all very welcome. However, in an extremely competitive FDI environment, at a time of rapid change, of technological disruption, we must work together to ensure that the quality of our talent pool is not just maintained, but is strengthened and is enhanced to become world class. And if we continue to attract inward investment on the back of that strength. Our clients seek a depth of subject matter skills, but they also look for broader skill sets and mindset. This is driven by the impact of the digital transformation and indeed decarbonisation across all areas of business. And with it, the need to manage, analyse and action data to drive productivity and innovation. The skills uh, um, impact of this are twofold. Firstly, educators need to develop fundamental digital and data skills as part of every student's transversal skill set. And secondly, the development of those transversal skill sets must be viewed as a key to strengthening and increasing our competitiveness of our talent. Such skills as critical and innovative thinking, agility and leadership, together with curiosity and a growth mindset are required by individuals and companies to navigate and thrive in the future. And universities have a central role to play in cultivating both skills and mindsets. But we must also recognise the importance of laying the foundations of critical thinking and innovation at post-primary and at primary level. Recent third level programmes have demonstrated the potential to innovate and co-create future focused programmes with industry that equip students with cutting edge skills and, and 
industry experience. Examples include the University of Limerick's, Limerick's Master in Immersive Software Engineering, MTU's Redesign Engineering Program, and DCU's, DCU's Future Program, Developing Transversal Skills, and many more funded under the HC Pillar 3 initiative, which focuses on producing adaptive, creative problem solvers sought by industry and by our FDI clients. We must continue to resource the third level education system to innovate program design and drive industry co-creation in this way. A growth mindset is one that embraces lifelong learning, the need for which has increased significantly over the past decade. In fact, data from LinkedIn shows that globally, the skill sets of jobs have changed almost a quarter since 2015 by 25%, and that by 2027, this is expected to double in terms of that change. Universities have a hugely important role in increasing participation in lifelong learning and delivering leading edge upskilling and reskilling programs. That's why the introduction of accredited stackable microcredits through the microcreds program is a welcome step in making learning more accessible and industry relevant. The learner's journey does not end with their formal education, and that goes for all of us. A continuous upskilling must become a permanent feature of workforce development. In terms of rd &I, Ireland as a country ranks ninth in the European Innovation Scoreboard of 2023. However, the scoreboard highlights significant areas of weakness in public and private sector expenditure in R&D and innovation. Innovation being the process by which companies create new or added value as opposed to developing new products or services. In 2022, IDA client companies spent 7 billion on in-house rd &I. Looking forward though, megatrends such as Industry 5.0, AI and quantum, the whole, whole area of healthcare in terms of advanced therapeutics, digital health and personalized medicine, present real opportunities for FDI of scale and complexity that will require a multifaceted approach of industry, academia, collaboration, and indeed building research excellence in, in embedding technologies. There is significant opportunity to deepen academia and industry partnerships in cutting edge research of strategic importance, and this must be supported by increased public investment in research capability. There is also a need to build innovation capability and capacity amongst the enterprise base. Companies who innovate are better placed to manage uncertainty, to solve challenges, and to grow more sustainably resilient operations. The skills to drive innovation are found within our universities. And as the OECD re review of Ireland's skills strategy identified, we must le leverage postgraduate talent in the workforce to strengthen our innovative capacity. In addition, universities and government agencies must work closely together to support the spin out of excellent research and develop an entrepreneurial capacity of our postgraduates. This is critical to building a vibrant rd &I ecosystem and cluster and increasing the R&D capacity of our entire enterprise base. The Science Foundation's uh, SFI centers of research training and the ARC hubs would support regional innovation and entrepreneurial training and accelerate research commercialization, and we believe they're fundamental. Remaining at the cutting edge of science and technology is critical to retaining our global competitiveness. The third level research ecosystem must continuously horizon scan for future disruptive research areas and the next generation of enabling technologies, helping to inform both industry of emerging opportunities and critically policymakers on the capacity we need to build now if we are to produce the researchers with the experience and the skills to attract the next generation of FDI and our enterprise from an indigenous perspective. A final point I would like to make is the criticality of diversity in the workforce. Ireland is an open, welcoming, and globally focused economy and society. MNCs are prioritizing diversity in their workforce as diversity and inclusion, inclusive workplaces are more innovative, agile, and have greater levels of customer satisfaction and employee engagement. 
the, the government's unified uh, tertiary system policy and the launch last year of 23 patriot programs for further to higher education is an excellent demonstration of Ireland's commitment to increasing access to higher education and enabling people from all backgrounds to enter renew, rewarding careers with industry and society benefiting from a diverse talent pool. In conclusion, as we reflect on the insights we're going to share this afternoon and ideas exchanged, I hope that one thing will be abundantly clear. The relationship between academia and industry is not just a theoretical concept, it's a catalyst for real world change. By forging stronger ties together, together, education and business, we can unleash a wave of innovation, drive economic growth, and equip our workforce with the skills needed to thrive in an increasing global uh, landscape. Thank you very much and look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Michael. There's uh, lots of things in there that we can unpick during our panel discussion. And I would now like to invite to the stage Professor David Fitzpatrick, Chair of the IUA and uh, TUI Dublin, and also Mike Berry, who's recently retired as Country Manager of Amazon Web Services in Ireland. He's also the newly appointed Chair of the UCD Governing Authority. Mike is an alumnus of UCD and the University of Pittsburgh. And before his return to Ireland seven years ago, he held global leadership roles in human resources with Amazon and Walt, the Walt Disney Company in the US. So I'm sure lots of food for thought from all of you. Do you mind? Can I move over this one? Sorry, I don't want to turn my back on him. Mike, they were um, fascinating comments from, from a number of different perspectives, but I guess um, I'm looking at all of this as someone who's worked in government and been um, part of those trade delegations that are going out into the world trying to seek international investment to come in. And, you know, talent or uh, well-educated workforce, as it was called back then in my time, uh, was always a huge part of the offering. And I was always amazed at and also very proud of how interested people were in the Irish education system. Um, and it really does give you an immense sense of pride that it's valued in the way that it is internationally. I think beyond our economic success, that was the thing that always struck me. People wanted to, to find the kernel of truth in, in what, what that was. Listening to you today, um, it's still very much part of your uh, offering when you go out into the world. Um, I remember it, it was the three T's, the talent, the taxation and the track record. Do you think we still have that track record um, that I remember, or do, has it kind of waned or in a co competitive sense internationally, how are we faring? Uh, so thanks. But first of all, it just strikes me we're going to have to do a better job in bringing up our, our, our current value proposition. The three T's are still resonating. But but I think it's still important because um, fu fundamentally, you know, what, what I hear back, and as I say, most recently in the last number of weeks, is the core competency of, of discussion with clients is around innovation and people. Um, and we're fortunate in Ireland that, you know, okay, this year we celebrate our 75th anniversary as IDA as an agency. Um, so we've built, I suppose, that very strong base of enterprise here in Ireland. So we have a, we're coming from a position of strength. But like all positions, you have to continue to add competitive advantage to that. And, and that's why, you know, we didn't get to this position without the people and without that innovation and that talent and that education. We won't get to the next trajectory without actually refocusing, um, to my mind, how we actually unleash the next generation of that talent. Because as you look across the world, the biggest problem that companies have in terms of expansion is, you know, you talk about uncertainty of policy and market access, and there are two elements, but none of those will actually be achieved if you don't have a workforce that's able to exploit that or to capitalize on mm. that. So the workforce is at the very center of what decision of what companies are making. Where can we find that workforce? Um, is that workforce going to be able to adopt and change to our business needs? Um, is the ecosystem in which we're coming into, and in this case, we talk about Ireland, will it adopt and change to our needs as well? And I think we've, you know, and the people in this room and, and those online, we have shown that in spades have been able to uh, adopt our delivery to actually generate an output as well. And that continues to be critically important. 
And Mike, if I could bring you in here, you've been on the absolute other side of this where you've sat at boardroom tables making these types of yes. decisions. Um, so when you're looking at it from that perspective, um, you know, how are you evaluating a country, first of all, and what are the type of skills that a massive company like Amazon will be looking at to acquire from, uh, from partnerships and relationships with someone like Ireland? And I think Michael has laid it out very well in terms of how uh, uh, foreign direct investment organizations think about where to go next and why. If I put it, I could put it this way, in, in the Amazon days, we would think about customer demand and capacity in the environment. And so signals in regard to how comfortable will our customers be that we their data is housed in Ireland, that the, it's a secure, safe, stable environment, as Michael points out. That's absolutely critical in terms of the top line decision. And then as you go through the decision making as to this place versus that place and the trade offs in terms of other jurisdictions, that question of capacity becomes absolutely critical. And obviously, it's things like infrastructure. So whether that is power, water, global air links, telecommunications infrastructure, capacity of the of the government to run a good environment. All of that is, you know, the first line of assessment. And then you get into the talent question, right? People. The people question. And so what 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 organizations at that level, what they want to know is again, it's back to one of the things you mentioned, which is the track record. Is there is there a pipeline of people who are available for potential new opportunities? And is there capacity in the third level uh, um, uh, sector to, to produce the kind of graduates and people with the right kind of skills and experience and, and curiosity to be able to have big impact for the company? And so, so for us, when, when we made big decisions about seven or eight years ago to, to really double down in Ireland, all of those factors came into play along with that sense of uh, confidence because other companies had made similar bets in the earlier years and saw good outcomes. Mm. But we made smaller bets in the beginning, built confidence, and then continued to invest. And so I'll give you one example um, in terms of, of the third level sector, and I'll slightly embarrass David as I do it. So, so when, we, when we started investing out in Tala in South Dublin, we, we're building a lot of infrastructure out there, and we were struggling to get enough talent to staff our, our um, facilities out there. We needed frontline people who had good technical skills. I had a conversation with Thomas Stone, who was the leader of the TU Dublin Tala campus at the time, and said, we're really struggling to find people who have these kinds of backgrounds. And from the day I had that conversation with Thomas till, till the day they had released a new curriculum for a program was five weeks, right? right? And that program has been running for seven or eight years now, and we continue to have great pipeline of, of, of I should say, AWS continues to have great pipeline of talent coming through the, the TU set, uh, system all across Dublin now. And so that level of flexibility, uh, collaborative planning, willingness to try stuff, that those kinds of signals, you know, I told that story every time I went back to Seattle and mm. said, this is another, we can continue to invest here. And then we were able to come in behind uh, organizations like Stripe and invest in the um, immersive software education program that's that's up and running now in UL. Again, a confidence builder in terms of pipeline and potential. David, if I could bring you in here, that's a really good example of practical application of relationship building where, as Mike said, they started small, they came in, they looked at the experience that they were having, the turnaround in putting something together, solving their problems. So those relationships that start uh, are really, really important. We're really good as a nation at developing relationships, I think, as well. Um, do you think universities at the moment have a lot of problems, as a lot of businesses do? There's funding issues for everybody. Do you think that universities are well-placed still to put the time, effort, energy, and finance into that type of relationship building that, that companies like AWS need? Absolutely, there they are. I mean, as you say, there are many challenges, but we all face a lot of challenges. Um, you know, one point of reference for the universities is, you know, since 2008, we're now dealing with 30% more students than we were in 2008. So, so the, the demand for university education is extremely high. Michael referenced the 62% uh, figure that, that's, you know, again, a, a real tribute to, to the, 
capacity of what we can do. Traditionally, university industry relationships would have been very much around the research space and, and you know, what can we work together on? How can we collaborate? And, you know, there are SFI and other funded programs for collaborative research. But that has changed. And, and Mike gave an example of, you know, a program being developed on the bespoke side. Michael referenced the Human Capital Initiative, HCI3, which again has broadly accessible educational and training opportunities, but also direct industry, university links to form around specialist, maybe cybersecurity or digital skills training and development for a particular organization. So, so I think universities are riding all of those horses at once. We want to increase our research capacity. We need to engage in industry to drive that. We want to form strong relationships and respond to the needs of industry on, on a broad education basis and also then on a bespoke basis. So, so it's very demanding, Yeah. but the desire to do it and to, to achieve it is still there. And HCI3 being one very current example, which runs out next year, if anybody's listening. Um, that's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you must have mentioned innovation more than any other word maybe in your speech and you were talking about research and those innovation research partnerships are expensive right um what more can we do uh, as as a nation i suppose and as universities to enhance that part of our offering yeah do you think we're doing enough um who could help us do more mm. what could they do Okay, so so the reason I mention it is because I fundamentally believe it's it's the key to the, to our competitive advantage. Um, because if you want to build enterprise that's you know long lasting, it needs to innovate. Um, and you have to do that whether that's an innovation of product or services or indeed of the business. And from an idea perspective, what we are seeing from our client companies is we are seeing an increased level of investment in that R D and I cycle. And you know I been an idea for uh, for two decades at this juncture and we used to talk about um you know having you know big d and small r but we no longer have big d and small r we have big d and we have a bigger r than what we had before and growing and we need to strengthen that and from an idea perspective we are very focused on making sure we we help companies to transform into that big r space mm. and what does that mean it means for us we can do that and within some multinationals Yes, they can do that within their own environments, but actually the benefit for us as an agency and as, as stakeholders is we want to see them engaging more deeply with the research institutions here in Ireland. Um, and if we're honest, we probably need to think about are we making it easy for them because they have choices. Mm -hmm. They can go to other parts of the world and do this. So are we have we the right conditions here to do it? Do we have the right IP regime? What are we trying to achieve here? And I think we need to take a fresh look at those elements, because I think in some areas we are not the most compelling location for that research. Mike, you're nodding away there. Um, you've obviously, you know, been into massive companies with global considerations, and now you know you're immersed in a university as well. So you're seeing this from all sides. Do you agree with with what Michael's saying there? I do. I do. I think. I think. Um, you know, maybe to to put a slightly different lens on it. I think companies make decisions around um, uh, uh, markets and economies. People make decisions around societies and communities, right? And I think in the university sector, we have to, we have to kind of meet people at, at that midpoint between those two demands. And so, so at one level, I fully agree with in terms of Michael saying, in terms of the level of innovation, the investment in research, and, and and I think the university environment, we can make investments in research that are kind of non-linear sometimes. They're, okay. they're, they're risky. They're, we don't know what's going to happen. We're going to try it. Whereas, whereas in a, in a, in a for-profit environment, you, you, you try to hedge your bets as best you can so you have a positive outcome, right? In, in the university setting, you can absolutely explore and innovate, and you don't know where, what, the, what will be the outcome. As we do that, we, we, we're developing skills, capacities, insights that become then the bedrock of assessment when a new organization comes to Ireland and says, we're going to build one of these. And we have to think from a society and a culture and a country perspective, is that, is that going to be good? Are we proud that's here? Does, is there, what's the implications from a society perspective, from a, a governance perspective, from a regulation perspective? So having people who understand that technology, even if we're not the leading edge of the invention of it, mm -hmm. having that assessment capability, the research um, 
insights in the society, I think, are going to be really important for Ireland in the future, to Michael's point, in terms of the level of change that's about to happen. Mm. David, just one of the other things that Michael mentioned in his speech was this, um, I suppose, change in the environment of, of learning and um, micro credentials and niche learning and learning more about a specific topic to make yourself, uh, I suppose, attractive to an industry, um, but also to enhance your own career with lifelong learning. And that we need to start, I suppose, thinking of universities as not just a place we go for a period of time, but something that's accessible to all of us throughout our life, throughout our career. Um, do you think that uh, all universities in Ireland are well placed to do that? Again, I'm going back to the whole, I know that there's challenges out there for everybody. Is there something more that you'd like to see from government on that front? Or uh, what does the landscape on those micro-credentials look like in Ireland? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've, I've been in higher education directly for 25 years and we've been talking about lifelong learning for 25 years um and i think actually we're but now, now it has a buzzword now, now, micro now we're on, now on the cusp of actually seeing some real change yeah and, mm -hmm. and i think the initiatives around micro credentials are really to be welcomed i think that's that's a really important step part of the lifelong learning problem is you know how do you resource people to engage with it so universities need to figure out how they can provide the offering in a way that's accessible and that might be a combination of in-person and online. We learned a lot through COVID. We should be benefiting from what we learned around how we deliver programs in that way. Um, but I think the, the big ask is, how do you separate the responsibility for paying for lifelong learning away from it being a company or a corporate responsibility to being part of a, a wider government portfolio of education? Mm -hmm. And you know this idea that, well, we'll pay you up to your bachelor's degree, you know, that the fees are covered, that's fine. But... You know, people have another 40 years um, and they need a way of accessing funding to engage in life learning in an area that interests them, not just their employer. So yeah, they my, can my, grow and develop. So the acquisition of talent now is no longer just about graduates either, is it? As we live in a, a very, uh, like, you know, talent poor environment in the sense that there's not enough of it to keep industry and companies going. Yeah. We've got to embrace that extension of the career of learning. Absolutely, you know, and so and to, um, Michael made reference to what what uh, many of the universities are leading on, especially DCU, in regard to the new approach to transversal skills, and um, that sense of transversal skills of having the ability to um, assess a situation where you may not have this direct in knowledge and and past experience on that becomes absolutely critical in the level of change that we have in in society in the world today so, so that, i just want to be clear about yeah, that if yeah. you don't mind the transversal skills so that's the capacity to understand problems in a sense but rather not from a, a learning perspective but that you have that core um basic in you know knowledge so one of the things that michael mentioned there was digital and data um, awareness and 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 that core learning about that is is a bit like our generation maybe it isn't your generation but my generation thought of english and math we have to produce a society that has that digital data thing at their core learning to a to a degree yes we absolutely need to have a digitally literate literate uh, um workforce but what when i'm thinking about in terms of the transversal skills is is you're suddenly faced with a problem you've never seen before. How do you go about thinking about that? So what's the information you need to gather to say, I, I've, I understand what's going on here. How do I collaborate with people who think differently than I do? How do I articulate my, my assessment of the issue? So it's that, that ability to, to face into something that you haven't faced before is, I think, one of the, those core capabilities that we have to have in across our workforce. And again, I think the university sector is doing an amazing job now in, in addressing that. So, so not, they're not just teaching to the task anymore. Mm. They're, they're starting to say, we need to uh, uh, empower people with an ability to, to have confidence in uncertainty. Yeah. Michael, one of the other things that you mentioned, it's kind of related to that a little bit, is that we need to create a broader mindset Mm. And so not just producing graduates, but rounded individuals. Yeah, yeah and, and look, maybe maybe I'm, I'm putting my own bias on the table as an engineer, like we think logically and, and so forth. That's that's how you were that's how you were educated. That was the part of it, you know, it was it was logic. Um but you know, I suppose what I learned from through my educational model, you know, I came out having done pure electronics, started my first my first job. 
then I actually started to learn, if I'm honest, right? Because I had all the theory, but interacting then in terms of those decisions, mm. yeah. I was facing problems that, to be honest, I didn't even know existed the week before or the two months before I left college to uh, working into in. So how do we actually, and what industry needs at this point is, um, and what I suppose, and that's where the lifelong learning element comes into it, is you have to be, yes, you need that technical expertise and there's base levels of it, um, and at one level, I think we went too far. We thought everyone needed to have masters upon masters upon masters. But actually what we need is you need to have technical competency, whatever that might be. But you also need to mirror that or, or complement that with that decision making, that ability maybe to, in some ways, to communicate actually and engage with others yeah. as well, yeah. because that's so critically important. I, I know of very few problems in this world that get solved by one person. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are or where you are. It involves a team. But we have to do more of that. So we need those rounded individuals mm -hmm. to be part of that. And obviously, the more the technology comes, you know, in some ways, more the more we can be threatened by those elements. But, but I do think when it comes back to it, ultimately people make decisions. You know, we decide what we use technology for or not. And the same goes whether you're in industry or in education. But you have to be positioned to make those decisions mm -hmm. as well. Michael, just to go back to the the partnership thing for for a moment. Um, Part of all of that is the practical experience that you need to get to to work in any industry. You can come out very well qualified, and then you need to to know how to operationalize all that learning, right? So the partnerships are important there, I guess, because yeah. you're you're supplying a stream of people, and they have to go someplace. And um, when you look back over your experience uh, working in Amazon, particularly with with Irish universities, um, are there any examples you give of you can give of a like even down to the detail of courses that you might have worked on that were specific to you, or does that level of detail not happen? Um, you know, I, I don't know that I would name a course, but I but I certainly would say that the 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 uh, the increased importance in um, internships and applied experiences and time in the workplace. To to Michael's point in terms of of you can learn so much in the classroom, but you like, how does it work in real life? Mm. And so I see a lot of the, uh, the, um, the kind of leading edge programs, including some of the, the, the programs that we collaborated on in, in TUD, uh, were about that blend of classroom uh, understanding and, uh, and an applied experience. One of the things in, in UCD now is we've, we've um, We've, we've changed how we approach the engineering program, for example. So you can do a five-year program that goes bachelor straight into a master's that includes a six or eight month immersive experience in, in one of uh, the companies that is a supporter of the, of the program. And so suddenly when you come out then, you, you can talk with real confidence in terms of I've done stuff, I've seen how trade-offs are made, I see how teams operate and things like that. So that sense of a blended experience I think is becoming more and more critical. Mm. David, um, just your ambition now as chair of the uh, IUA for, for the next year, look, what would you like to see happening in this particular space to advance? As Michael has said, it's, it's not just enough anymore to be competitive. You've got to be seen around the corners and, and ahead of the curve. What would you like to see happening um, on the FDI sort of innovation front from the university's perspective? I think there are, there are a number of areas of opportunity. Um, sticking with lifelong learning for, for a minute, I think uh, universities are uniquely placed in that we can provide both the technical skills and the education and the internship opportunities that a lot of FDI organizations are interested in. But to Michael's point around the need for critical thinking, um, problem solving, innovation, we also have the opportunity to draw on the arts and humanities and, and bring in all of those elements into mm -hmm. a wider science base or engineering based education. And I think there's opportunity for us to draw on that and really make a difference and, and to start to figure out how we integrate that more fully. Um, on the research side, definitely opportunity for enhanced collaboration and, and figure out how we leverage Research Ireland, which will come into being shortly, we hope. Uh, I know Philip's sitting over there somewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and that, again, is bringing together SFI and the IRC in, into a single organizational space, which I think is a big opportunity for us. And I think ultimately then it does come back to, from the IOA's point of view, how do we look at getting a longer term view of the financial modeling and budgeting processes that are going to underpin what's happening? I, I think, you know, I understand the reasons and I understand the rationale for why 
we budget on an annual basis at government level. But having a three or a five year line of sight, not an absolute promise, but mm -hmm. a line of sight of where we want to go as a country in terms of investment and, and growth and support and development of education in other areas, I think is really important. Mm. And I guess having a government department dedicated to this area now, is that a help? I, I think that, is, that has been a really significant change and it is a very important uh, element that brings together not just the tertiary education, but also the research, the innovation, the enterprise, R and IDA, everybody mm. coming together into a single shared space. And it helps that really focus on, on the imperatives around tertiary education and beyond. Whereas before, as higher education institutions, we were within the Department of Education, which was very much dominated by secondary and primary education. Mm. So, so I think it's been a step change and really important. Collaboration key to all of this, Michael. Like you, you know, you got to get all the pieces working together. What it, could FDI do, or what could IDA do to to help the university space as well? Yes. Yeah, so, so you, so you're absolutely right. It's collaboration. The, the future is is about collaboration because there's so many challenges out there, and as I said, you know, very few problems are solved by by the person of one or the whatever that might be. But what can we do? And I think what what I spoke to was the areas of focus, and that's where we're working with 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 Philip and his team in terms of. Those thematic areas to us of the future, as we look at the horizon, you know, we're looking at AI and quantum, real opportunity. And I know there's a lot of conversation about AI, and I can come back to that in a moment from an enterprise perspective. But there are areas that we need to build capacity, capability from a research, from an education perspective, and an, and an enterprise perspective. Um, advanced manufacturing, you know, I mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Critically important. The backbone of our economy, you know, has been, is, and continues to be our manufacturing strength, both for FDI and indigenous. And I think the whole area, and it speaks to that digital transition. So we go back full circle then, mm. we're talking about the future employee has to be digital, digitally enabled, because that's where that, 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 that area is going. And then healthcare, you know, whether in advanced therapeutics, cell and gene therapy, can we build competency in that area? The whole area of digital health, we have the world's leading digital companies here in Ireland, with the world leading healthcare companies in Ireland. We have a real opportunity to be to be different there. So I think you know to to, to Mike's earlier point is, you know we, we through the educational system and through our research system, we have to place our chips on where we believe the best impact can be mm. from a, that there's a, a a result both from a societal perspective and an enterprise perspective. And to us, there are some of those opportunities that mm. sit in there. Maybe I might just share just on on AI just a perspective because it's, it gets so much conversation. Um. In the last number of weeks, and, and particularly when in, in, on the west coast of the US and, and following in Davos in, in, in mid-January, the conversation wasn't just about the technology. Actually, from an enterprise perspective, they were actually talking about what does this mean for skills, for people? And that was, to me, that was heartwarming to hear. It's not about, like, to be honest, most, most enterprises cannot take just more technology and layer it in. They have to understand what it means for their business. And when, they, when they were having that conversation, what do they practically mean when they say, what does it mean for the people? Do they mean, yeah. are the people going to be displaced or no, what we, skills we, we, will they get? Correct. So, 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 so there's two things. So first of all, companies and enterprise in particular are looking at AI and saying, OK, what does this mean for my business? How can I bring it in ethically and fairly and in regulatory requirements? And then what does that mean for my activities and indeed the workforce? So how do we evolve the workforce? Because this is a new tech, another technology. We've had many technology before, and Mike can speak to those better than I can. So in some ways, but the pace of technology we know has increased. So therefore, mm. our pace of change has to increase, our pace of which we actually get people to adopt and move. Because some of our activities, which possibly we all do every day, will can be revolutionized by AI, but there'll be other, it'll free us up to do other higher value, different activities, come back to that decision making, Again, so I think that's where our enterprise base has gone is, how do we bring AI in? What does it mean to our business? And more importantly, how do we manage that in and make sure we transition people uh, in that context as mm. well? And I think we're going to see this over the next, it's going to take probably a decade for that to come true. Yeah, Mike, I was thinking about AI the other day and trying to equate it to some other evolution of uh, an industry. And I was thinking about the newspaper industry. If, if, if we were talking about the news industry, we're not even at the stage where someone's on a bicycle flinging it up the driveway. Like, I mean, this time last year, a lot of us hadn't even heard of AI and chat GPT and all of that. Yeah. What's your perspective on that as somebody who's obviously been exposed to this for, for many, many years yeah. from within a company? Well, I mean, I think, I think it's 
burst into the kind of public consciousness in the last 12 months, but in reality, machine learning and artificial intelligence, that's, people have been working on that for years and years and years. We have it all around us as we speak in terms of, you know, how, how uh, everything from like, how do you price an airline ticket to how do you decide what, uh, what options show up on your, on, your, on your feed, on your social media. There's how a lot of customer service interactions are now managed is all through. It's ubiquitous. It's, it's we there just already. Know, we yeah. just didn't know what to call it, yeah, right? Yeah. But there is an implication, I think, beyond um, what we know about already is to make sure that we're being thoughtful about what are the long-term implications for it. And that, that's to Michael's point about the people piece. It's, there's also about the societal piece, the cultural piece, and things like that. In the end, uh, I don't think we're going to see people out uh, on the streets being laid off because of AI. I think people's jobs will will evolve. Hopefully, we'll get to a stage where where some of the things that are that can be automated, that can be uh, managed through through technology, will be done so. And then the higher judgment, what we've been talking about for the first 15, 20 minutes, the high judgment, the collaboration, the assessment of risk, all those high judgment things become what you need a really uh, well-rounded uh, workforce for. Mm. Looking at this from the complete other side, David, um, from students, are you getting more people interested in this type of technological innovation and more demand for these type of courses? Do you think that ultimately we'll be able to compete in this space internationally from a student's perspective? Well, uh, absolutely. We currently do and will continue to compete in, in this space. I mean, I think, uh, as Mike said, AI and machine learning has been around for a long time, so we already have a base uh, that's that's really strong nationally. Um, from the student's point of view, there's an area of, of interest where new programs can be offered and, and where there's the opportunity to learn new skills. From the university's point of view, we're interested in that. We're also interested in figuring out how do we work with students who are going to be using it mm -hmm. in a way that we may or may not want them to use it. And, and so it comes back into really examining how we deliver what we do and and how we help people to learn but longer term for me i think the the fundamental piece is that in any particular discipline space in any particular area of education the fundamentals are, are there you have to be able to ground people in the fundamentals and have really strong intellectual capacity in those the added value that we can provide to to fdi organizations and others is around how they as graduates are then able to critically assess what's coming in through ai tools and really validate whether they are correct or not and make judgments on the back of not just what's in front of them, mm -hmm. but a critical assessment of what's coming through from various feeds and using that. It, it's that, that ability to really critically assess, determine what's right and figure out where the errors are because not everything that's on the screen is true. Yeah, and, that's, and that's a big challenge for everybody. And it, it is a multifaceted, complex problem, particularly yeah. for universities, because yeah. you've got to look at it from, from all aspects, the positive and the potential yeah. misuse of it as well. Um, Michael, I want to go... Um, a little bit into the future from an FDI perspective. You mentioned the 2023 results there and New Greenfield um, Industries, you know, traditionally to say we're, we're used to technology, done very well in the pharmaceutical space. What are those Greenfield areas that you secured last year? Is there any other potential ones that you're looking at for 2024 yeah. um, that broaden out, I suppose, our traditional base? Yeah, so, so um, if, if we look to, to, to last year, first of all, what, what drove those numbers in particular was our life sciences industry continues to be very innovative, both from a pharma and a medical device. Uh, we've seen incredible growth in, in those areas. Um, our international financial services sector has been continues to grow and is strong. Do you think and Brexit has as a well I think we've I think we've 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 gone past Brexit if we're honest. Um but yes Brexit was was and there, there still is if you want to call it a, a breakfast a Brexit bounce in some of those elements. But critically in the financial services sector what we're seeing is a deeper embracement of that innovation and research and particularly at looking at the area of AI. It's it's really encouraging to see how that sector is embedding itself in technology really? and innovation, absolutely, mm. and are accelerating their innovation capacity as well. Um, so that's a real growth. And the third area we've seen, we've seen growth and reflecting in last year's numbers was what we would have classified as our as our in, in industrial engineering category. 
but actually it's not industrial engineering, it's technology engineering, it's engineering on autonomous vehicles, it's on the new modes of transportation, you know, so we're looking at those areas through a lens of technology and innovation. Just as an aside, that's very interesting, I just, I'd read something recently about a lack of people going into engineering on the energy side, um, traditional energy engineering as we would know it, yeah. Uh, because of climate considerations, transition to a lower carbon society and all that, even geologists are not as yeah, well, well, I suppose, uh, well, the other big opportunity then is the whole area of, of, renewable. of sustainability yeah, and renewable. Yeah, yeah. And, and that comes in every facet and form, whether, whether you talk about solar, wind, you know, hydrogen. So so there's, there's so much opportunity going to come in terms of, of the sustainable agenda Absolutely. and multiple you know, facets I, within it. I agree. Yeah. I just think that there is a bit of a job of work to be done to kind of make there, people realise that going is. into the energy and industry is I, positive. I, absolutely, because I think... Yeah, the energy in industry of the past is not the energy in industry of the future. Yeah. And in a couple of weeks time, um, the, the government will be launching their industrial strategy for offshore wind. So it's it's taking, I suppose, if you want to call it the overarching strategy for sustainability. And so what does this mean at an industrial level? Yeah. And from that, then we'll under, so hopefully that also will show the, 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 I suppose, the roadmap for that future talent to look at at the whole energy space and sustainable space. This is going to be a real area of excitement and growth. Mm. And Ireland can actually be at the can be at the centre of that as well. Mike, um, we're kind of running out of time now, so I, I want to ask you, as somebody who's come from um, big industry outside of Ireland, back to Ireland, and now you're in a university, yeah. um, being in immersed in the university and the governing authority and all of that now, does that change your perspective in any way? I, I think it has, and I think it's an evolving one. I think I think it's broadening my lens, if you like, because, because I think... Um, sitting on top of, of a large tech uh, business, I was very focused on the talent pipeline in terms of people who, who can uh, add value to, to our environment as quickly as possible. We still wanted people who had a wide variety of experiences and, and life skills. You know, I'm a social worker sitting on top of a tech company, so, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, an example of somebody who has a different uh, experience who can still add value, I, I hope, anyway, to, to that. But Coming into UCD, I think one of the things I, I appreciate is back with that point about that intersection between between enterprise and society, right? And so, at, you know, we're about to embark on our five-year strategic planning cycle for UCD now. And, you know, when you think of the scale, scope, and breadth of what uh, an environment like UCD does, uh, you would imagine I would be the guy saying we need to have more engineers, but but one of the things I think I'm I'm, I'm surprising people by saying a place like UCD also needs to be the place where we have a great arts education, where we have people who really deeply understand culture and folklore and history and music, where we continue to have people who are world specialists in in the classics and things like that. Because when you think about what a society needs, we need those people. And those, the skills that you may get by going really deep into Irish folklore, can, you may find yourself then still being able to, to say, how do I go about a really complex research problem that could be in a, in a different setting? So having that breadth of subject matter expertise, curiosity about the past uh, is absolutely vital, I mm -hmm. think, as we continue to think about what this, what's the society we want to build and what's the capabilities we need to have across society. And one, just one last sure. thing, on, because you, you mentioned about, about the sustainability and about the, the whole question about people maybe not going into geology. One of the things that I've been delighted to learn going into UCD is, is we now have a, a degree in sustain, sustainability. People come in and have a core first year experience, but then we've got people who come in from engineering, they come in from social science, they come in from, from politics and law. And so suddenly you've got a multidisciplinary group of people learning together, trying to solve really gnarly complex problems. And so that's an ex so part of what's happening is we're, we're, we're still attracting those kinds of people. It might be called something different now, but it's still going to be addressing some of those systemic challenges around sustainability and mm. decarbonization. And David, it is. It's all about adapting, isn't it? Being agile and, and as Mike said there, changing maybe existing courses, configuration to adapt to the needs of industry, but also to speak to your point originally, which is, look, universities are many communities. They can't be one thing. They've got to be all things. Um, are you sort of 
comfortable now in this post-COVID environment that we are nearing a point where we've kind of dealt with the legacy issues of the remote learning and all that. Like students of that time have gone through such a very difficult time because they lost out on all of that great community. Um, but as you look to kind of the overarching perspective of, of the sector, do you think we've found a, a spot now where we're comfortable with how universities are operating with that kind of co-location issue? I, th I think uh, I think we're getting there. I, I think there are, as I said earlier, that there are a lot of things we have learned from the COVID experience. And I mean, last summer's conferring for TU Dublin, 5,000 students coming through. Anyone who'd done a bachelor's degree was there. They were the first students to come through mm -hmm. TU Dublin and had that COVID hit with you know massive impact on, on them. But they all came through. They've all graduated. They've all gone to jobs, or most. Uh, and uh, and I think we've learned a lot about how to deal with that. And I think that really helps us then build and feed into the future lifelong learning models, the micro credentials, and the improvements in it. So we haven't got the final solution, and we never will. Mm -hmm. um, but we've evolved to a point now where I think that we're actually at a jumping off point for a next step in in terms of how we improve and enhance that. And we're always learning. Yeah, always. Michael, I'm going to leave the, the final word on all of this to you. You're off to um, America in a couple of weeks on a lovely little tour yeah. where you'll be relaxing a lot, I'm sure. <laughs> but you'll be out there in the world talking about Ireland, trying to get those new cutting edge businesses interested in coming here. Um, what more would you like to see from the university sector or even the government in helping you to get those people interested in coming here and looking at Ireland, maybe even in a new way. Yeah, so 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 you're right. So look, at the, that's what the team does on a day to day basis um, across the globe for for IDA. So what more? I think we have to continue doing what we do well, and I think what, what we we have to recognise what we do well as well. So I think that's important. Like we we have that track record. We 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 have we're coming from a position of strength. There's no doubt about that. So, but we do need to strengthen our research capability. We need to strengthen those relationships with academia and industry. We need to, if I'm honest, we need to do it at scale as well. Um, and to me, that's how we do we do that? How do we how, do, how do we, I think we do that. We do that through a few different ways, right? We do that by focusing on on the thematic area that's important to us, both from an enterprise and society perspective. Um, and then we do it through focus. And the one thing we know in Ireland we're good at, you know. Um, despite you know, all, all of, all of our, our, our different um, challenges is, when we focus on a challenge, we actually can bring results, and we've shown that. And I think with the whole of, of government, the whole of agency, education, with enterprise, sitting together and saying, these are our big challenges, how do we work together to collaborate? And let's make sure that we do that in an open manner, that, you know, that we can actually, we don't put barriers in the way of that collaboration. That's what we need to do, because if I'm honest, the future for, any society, Irish society or indeed any society in terms of enterprise is we have to have collaborative environments that support the needs of society and enterprise, both foreign and indigenous. And that's going to be based on a plentiful supply of sustainable energy. It's also going to be based on a plentiful supply of talent and it's going to be based on collaboration. They're the key three points. Well, look, I think that's a great note to to end it on. And I've certainly enjoyed today's discussion. I found it very, very informative and interesting um, way to spend your lunch break. I hope everyone agrees. I'd like to, to thank all of our guests today. Michael Lowen, who's CEO of IDA Ireland, Professor David Fitzpatrick, President of TU Dublin and Chair of the IUA, and also Mike Berry, former I knew, I'd, I knew I'd get it wrong at some point. I was going to say county manager <laughs> of uh, Amazon Web Services and now chair of the UCD Governing Authority. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Now, before we close up today, I'd just like to remind you all that the next Future of Ireland event is on the 7th of March when Ilana Ivan Ivanova, who is the European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education and Youth, will be giving her views on developments in research and research funding in Europe and the opportunities that exist for Ireland. And if you want to get that, the registration details for that event are on iua.ie. I also have been asked to mention that season two of My Uni Life, which is a nine part documentary series showing a busy year across campuses of the eight IUA universities will begin on RT1 and RT Player on February the 16th, that's Friday at 8 p.m. So be sure to watch it. Thank you very much for all your attention today and enjoy the rest of your day.
Very good. Thank you. Thank you. That was great.